Ladies and gentlemen, fellas, 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 welcome back to the YouTube channel and the podcast. Sal Vetri here, and today I'm going to be talking about some early round running backs that you're going to have to draft. Now, we've already talked about some early round draft strategies and early round running back strategies in terms of when you should be selecting who and really what kind of tiers in which you want to be looking at. You can check out those videos already up on the channel and podcasts and on the YouTube channels in the 2020 playlist. But what we're going to be doing today is identifying specific targets in those rounds. Now, let's make this very clear. The video says must draft early round running backs, right? And that's going to include the first, second, third round, maybe the fourth round if you want to get to that and then they start to get to your mid-round picks. But what I want to say about this is you're not going to see Christian McCaffrey. You're not going to see Saquon Barkley on this list. You're going to see guys that you actually will have the opportunity to draft, right? Those guys, unless you're in the top three picks, you're not getting Zeke, Saquon, maybe Kamara, right? CMC, you're not getting those guys. So we're going to be talking about guys that are going towards the end of the first round and into the second round because that means that you've had at least an opportunity to draft them. So I want to make sure that I'm including value for the majority of the people. Now, if you're only playing in one fantasy draft this year and you got first and you're taking Saquon or McCaffrey or whatever it is there, there's still going to be some pieces at the end of this video. I'm going to give you four guys today. So two of them are going to be closer to the first round. Two of them will probably be going in the second to third rounds of your drafts, maybe even a little bit later, which means you're definitely going to have the ability to draft them if indeed you are a early round draft pick this year in your draft and McCaffrey is safe one early up top. So on these sons of guns, just sit back, relax your shoulders a little bit, let them dance if you need to, whatever stresses and worries you got on the world right now, just let them go. Let them go out the window. This is your time. You got 15 to 25 minutes or so, whatever this video is going to end up being to just relax for yourself. And please do, if you could just help me out a little bit here for free, hit the like button on this video and the big subscribe button. We're at the end of July right now. These videos are going to start to pick up a lot of traction and any of them might just pop off. So the more of you that subscribe within the video, it's totally free to do so. It helps this channel organically grow. YouTube just props it up when it sees more people subscribing within the video because they're saying, hey, these people are liking what this guy is saying enough to listen to his commands to subscribe. So thank you. I really do appreciate that. And also behind me right now is the Supreme Draft Guide. It's just, this is the running back profiles. This is one of the one of the many benefits that you're going to get in there, whether it's rankings, tiers, the key stats, right? Reliability charts, these player profiles, premium analysis. So you can find all this in there. And we're gonna just go through here and I'm gonna be discussing a couple of players, right? Four guys on the running backs. If you wanna get this, thanks to Monkey Knife Fight up above. It's at the end of July. I don't know if they're gonna hit me with an email that says the offer is no longer. I don't know when they're gonna do that, if they're going to do that. It's only $10 right now, thanks to Monkey Knife Fight. You can find out information on how to get it down below. It's going to make you much more informed than your league mates. It's going to give you a much better chance of beating your league mates down below. Check it out. So let's start this one off. And, and the first guy we're going to talk about is actually on this list right here. He's actually at top of the list right now. And that man's name is Joe Mixon. Now, Joe Mixon is somebody that uh, is a little bit interesting this year for many of reasons. You have a Bengals offense that should be a little bit revamped. They get AJ Green, although he's 32 years old, maybe he's got one to two years left in the chamber. Most receivers usually break down around that year 33, 34 age span. 32, he might still have one left. You have the first round pick in Joe Burrow. You have the first pick of the second round in T. Higgins, a wide receiver out of Clemson. So a little bit of a revamped team. Also to help Joe Mixon the most, Jonah Williams, a top end draft pick that they had last year, was out for pretty much all of last year, is now going to be coming back for what was a bad offense of line. And then you also just look at Joe Mixon, what he did last year. Let me prop up some stats right now for you. Joe Mixon in 2016 and 16 games, 62% of the snaps, 278 carries for over 1,100 yards and eight touchdowns. But then he had 35 receptions for 297 yards. So he had over 300 touches. That's what we want out of our running backs. If we can find a bell cow that's seeing over 300 touches combined through the air and receiving or just combined total, that's going to be very good for us. The fact that he has a receiving role as well, over two receptions per game with guys like Giovanni Bernard in the backfield is also good to see. I think that role even expands this year. He saw 313 total opportunities, which was 17.4 per game. He was fifth in the NFL in carries, but there's a lot of other stats on here that really stand out. He was seventh in red zone touches. That's a good opportunity on an offense that was bad, right? So when they were in the offense, they were feeding Joe Mixon. Now, AJ Green will be back this year, so maybe they don't do it as much. They have another rookie wide receiver, but I still do think he's going to have a heavy role in the offense. And the nice thing is that he was the only running back on this team basically seeing red zone touches, and he was number one in evaded tackles. And the evaded tackle one is the big one. He had 103 evaded tackles. If he gets a decent line this year, Jonah Williams coming back hopefully propels that line forward. It just naturally is going to have to. It's going to be very good for Joe Mixon, a guy who was doing it really all on his own back last year. And another thing that trends nicely is his second half production. And I'll call it out right now before showing Graham Barfield's tweet of what was happening in terms of his overall opportunities. But this is what happened last year from pretty much week eight on. Week eight, he scores 17.7 fantasy points. He's the RB13. Then the following week in week 10, they have a buy. So week 10, he scores 17.1. He's RB9. The week after that, 17.3. He's RB8. Then 7.9, he finishes RB27. Then 17, RB15. Then 27.3. These are, these are his final four weeks. 27.6 was the third running back. 18.6 was 11th. 
9.3, and 30.6. So in the second half of the season, his two worst performances were 7.9 points against Pittsburgh's very good run defense and 9.3 points. Other than that, he was scoring 17 or more points in the other seven weeks. He was just absolutely beast moding it the second half of the year. And here's Graham Barfield's tweet just about that. After the week nine bye, those final eight weeks of the season, you ended up getting for him a fantasy point per game spike from 10 to 18.2, making him the RB41 in the first half of the season to the RB7 in the second half of the season. That's very good to see. You see a bunch of things just change. His scrimmage yards go from 53.8 to 124.3, third most in the league from 39th. His touches go from 28th in the league to third most in the league with 24.1 from 15. His routes run go from 16.3 to 22.6. His snap percentage 54% to 66%. So he pretty much just started to stay on the field more, especially for third downs, pushing Giovanni Bernard off the field. And like I said, he ran behind a terrible offensive line. You can see they were ranked 31st in run blocking. That was with Jonah Williams hurt all year. Many injuries throughout the whole season. Corgi Glenn was suspended and not working with the team. And they just had some drama going on there. He's no longer going to be with the team, as you can see from the offseason addition and subtractions through the draft they get Burrow they get T Higgins they get a tackle in the sixth round through free agency they pick up an offensive lineman but for the most part it's going to be a very similar line except you're getting Jonah Williams back this year finishing 31st last year if they can just finish 20th this year Mixon's going to be in line for a lot of opportunity and I do think that if Joe Burrow is half as good or even three quarters as good as what we think he's going to be it's a huge upgrade from what they had last year and Joe Mixon in the game script for this team in general goes from Joe Mixon seeing 17 touches per game and opportunities per game to now maybe seeing 20 per game and now he's seeing three 300 carries and not even factoring in his receptions. He could actually have a 350 touch season, Joe Mixon. He's set up to be that bell cow. He has the skills to pop off as a top five running back. He's currently my RB6 in my rankings, and he is a must draft running back for us this year and any point, right? And definitely in those early rounds. Next up is the former LA Ram, the new Atlanta Falcon going into the number one passing offense from last year in Atlanta is Todd Gurley. And Todd Gurley is somebody that I keep pushing up my book. And now this is a veteran running back that Honestly, he's not extremely old. People want to make him out to be like 30 years old. This is a 26-year-old running back still. So yes, 26 is when you start to break down, quote unquote, but he's still a guy that I want to have. I think 28 is when you start to really hit a wall. 30 plus is obviously when the lifespan of running backs usually for the good running backs starts to end. But Todd Gurley for me is somebody that I definitely want to be owning. You can start to get Todd Gurley in the third. If you get Todd Gurley in the third round still, you have a very good team in my opinion. Now there's going to be analysts out there who say, I don't want anything to do with Todd Gurley or Le'Veon Bell and these old running backs. And honestly, I don't want much to do with Le'Veon Bell either. But Todd Gurley is a totally different case and a totally different animal. The, the idea that you were scared that Todd Gurley is going to get hurt this year was the exact same idea people had last year on Todd Gurley when he ended up playing 76% of the snaps, the sixth most in the league amongst any running backs. He was one of the most healthy running backs in the league last year. Yes, one of the most healthy running backs in Todd Gurley was just using the same sentence. Why are you scared? Because other analysts and some guys with big followings are telling you, ah, this guy's got a bum knee still. Okay, if he had a bum knee still last year, explain to me how he held up on 76% of the snaps last year. Now, he wasn't extremely efficient, no. And they also didn't use him as much in the passing game, so that's not his fault. He didn't have the opportunity to get his overall yards per touch higher through the receiving game. Last year, he only had 31 receptions on 50 targets. It, it was about a, a third or, or around a half as much as what he was seeing the year before that, 3.3 targets per game. He had 223 carries on the ground for 857 yards and 14 touchdowns. Now, those aren't good numbers, right? His overall yards per carry is not good based on that. He had the 59 receptions the year before and 81 targets. So there was a huge drop in overall volume of his work based on how they used him, but then also his overall efficiency. But he also ran behind the worst offensive line, dead last offensive line in the league last year. So let's just sit here and think for a second. Okay, not everybody can be Joe Mixon, like we just said, and lead the league in abated tackles and run behind the second worst line and still produce in major ways. Todd Gurley was able to go over 1,000 total yards last year and able to score 14 touchdowns, which was just his red zone role in the offense, which he's still going to have this year. And we'll get to that in a second based on backfield competition. But he was able to do all that behind the dead last ranked offensive line, what he had with the Rams last year. So I'm going to give him a little bit of a break there. And I'm also not going to say I'm terrified of this guy's knee when the guy in last year goes for over 250 touches on 76% of the snaps. I think people are blowing that out of proportion. His final eight games of the season, so his second half of the season last year, so the parts of the season where people would think that he's starting to break down a little bit, he was 10th in yards, 5th in touchdowns, 11th in fantasy points per game, and he was 27th in receptions amongst running backs. So he was still producing and being very active. His efficiency, though, not great. Number 48 in true yards per carry, 42nd in yards after contact, 67th in yards created, and 71st in fantasy points per opportunity. Yeah, those, those numbers are not very good, and that's exactly what I was just telling you. Some of it is Adam Todd Gurley. Some of it is still that he's not this 23, 24-year-old 
year old peak running back. Yes, there's going to be natural uh, just regression off of his his top seasons. But then a lot of it, I'm going to actually put the blame on some of that offensive line the way that I look at it, at least right now. This is what Todd Gurley did in four of the last final weeks last year. He was productive and he's going to be the lead back in this backfield right now. But the last four to the five weeks, he was a top 20 back or better. And in three of those four weeks, he was a top 10 back or better. He finished in week 13, 18 and a half fantasy points, 14, 21 and a half, uh, 15, 18 and a half, 16, 16 and a half. And in the final week of the season, 10.9, which is still a top 30 running back. And the interesting thing was towards the end of the season, he started to evade more tackles. Weeks 13 and 14, he evaded seven tackles in each of those weeks. So that's good to see as his snap counts were remaining extremely high. You can see in week 15, he played 97% of the snaps towards the end of the season. When again, his legs are supposed to be breaking down even more. He played his highest snap shares. Week 14, 79%, and then on, 97%, 77%, and 73%. That is not a running back, in my opinion, that you should be worried about being uh, injured when they're increasing his snap share as the season goes on. His backfield competition, there is none. He's literally one of four running backs, maybe even three running backs, Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, Todd Gurley, and then maybe you can find me one other running back that has no backfield competition right now. Uh, David Montgomery, seems like he doesn't, but yes, he does in Tariq Cohen, right? There's guys who have a ton of backfield competition, and Todd Gurley has none of that. He's about to come into a workload of where he saw 250 plus touches last year, even with Malcolm Brown seeing about 20% of the snaps, Daryl Henderson seeing about 10% of the snaps, right? This year, those guys aren't in this backfield. Brian Hill, Quadre Olison, Ido Smith, Craig Reynolds. Craig Reynolds is, is a name I have to say as backfield competition in Atlanta. Those guys aren't going to be doing anything. Olison last year as a rookie only saw 22 touches. Ito was injured last year. He only saw 22 touches as he continues to fall down the depth chart here. And then Brian Hill was as dusty as ever last year. 78 overall carries, 323 yards. His true yards per carry was absolutely atrocious, 35th. And his fantasy points per opportunity was 82nd amongst running backs. So no competition. The guy is healthier than people's expectations are. So they're drafting him later than he's actually going. And he's going to have a huge workload. And I should I mention that this offense is always in the red zone and they never closed the deal in the red zone in the passing game. So maybe they finally have a running back who can get it done in the red zone because he's very familiar with being in the red zone. Hence his 59 red zone rushing attempts last year in 15 games, which was third in the NFL. You're going to have a young offensive line where they had two first round picks last year. One of them who was hurt for a while. The other one who just struggled. They're going to have another year to advance. They added Justin McCray in free agency. And they added a center in Matt Hennessy in the draft. So the offensive line is going to be improved and also getting more experienced this year and healthier after uh, Lindstrom last year, first round pick was hurt for them with Todd Gurley coming in. I think it makes for him to be a very good pick. He's my RB13 right now. A lot of people have him as like RB18, maybe RB15. I have him ahead of Clyde edwards hilaire by one spot. You're not going to find that in many places because everybody wants to jump on the hype train of Clyde edwards hilaire Look, I have, I have him at RB14. I think he's still going to be a fine pick. I think there's a lot more risks there. I honestly think Todd Gurley is a safer running back option than Clyde edwards hilaire you can, your, your heads can explode on that, but then you can come to the table and tell me why you think the other way. And when you tell me that you think Clyde edwards hilaire is going to play 80% of the snaps, you can go back and watch my top early round bust potential type of guys because Clyde edwards hilaire is going to be one of them, mainly because of the fact that in this type of an offseason where rookies aren't getting a lot of experience, if that guy is only going to go out there and get you 30 to 40% of the snaps for most of the season, how is he going to pay off a second round draft capital or a late first round pick? We've talked about Miles Sanders a lot on this channel and we're going to continue. I like Miles Sanders and for me, there's not a lot of reasons why I shouldn't like Miles Sanders. Again, in 16 games last year, he stayed healthy in all of them. Came out of some games mid-game because of some little ankle injuries and lower body injuries, but never actually missed the rest of the game, never missed a full game. He played on 53% of the snaps as for the first half of the season or maybe even a little bit more, first 12 games or so, first 10 games really, he was kind of stuck behind a guy in Jordan Howard. And even with having a suppressed workload as a rookie, he ended up seeing 179 carries for over 800 yards and six touchdowns. That's pretty efficient. But then you factor in his 50 receptions for over 500 yards on 63 targets, and it's looking really good. So overall, this is a player who sees over 1,300 yards on 229 total touches, 14.3 per game. But in his final six games, he averaged 19.6 touches per game. Let me tell you the workload of Miles Sanders, the final six games of the season for him, when he really started to take over as this team's lead back. This is the workload for him. In week 12, he sees 15, then he sees 22, then he sees 19, then he sees 25, then he sees 25. Five, final week he sees 12. So even in the final week where he only sees 12 touches, that's a game that he actually left the game early. Boston Scott got a lot of second half run. Even factoring in that week, he was seeing 19.6 touches. If you take out that week and you just look at week 12 to week 16, those five weeks, he's seeing about 21 and a half touches per game during the final six, five games of the season, right? Pretty nuts stuff for Miles Sanders' overall workload. Go to Philadelphia Eagles.
Eagles team that was just forced to sort of run more last year when they had no good receiver, a bunch of receivers. Nobody got over 1,000 yards. Greg Ward was the leading receiver for Carson Wentz, and it speaks volumes of how good Carson Wentz was. Number one rated run blocking unit is not going to be as good this year since Jason Peters is currently not signed, potentially going to retire. Brooks just tore his ACL or whatever, and he's out for the year. So the offensive line is going to be a little bit more of an issue, but that would, that would scare me more if this was a running back who was uh, reliant on running in between the tackles. Miles Sanders, very similar to his teammate at Penn State, Saquon Barkley, is not a great in between the tackles runner. They're guys who like to get to the outside, and that's where they just coast past linebackers, coast past defensive backs, and also in the receiving game, then that's not obviously going to be in between the tackles. So I'm not as concerned with a guy like Miles Sanders when it comes to that type of stuff. And now you have no Jordan Howard this year, who's now in Miami, if you are not familiar with that. And Jordan Howard last year saw 14.8 touches per game and 44% of the snaps. So now 14.8 touches per game have to be filled in, and they started to get filled in towards the end of the season last year by, you guessed it, Miles Sanders. Now the main backfield competition, they're signing some guys. They signed Corey Clement to a one-year contract. As I'm recording this, they haven't signed a Devonta Freeman or a Lamar Miller or some sort of veteran running back. There's rumors that they might. And if they do, I'm going to have even more interest in Miles Sanders. You want to know why? Because nothing will change for Miles Sanders for me if they sign a veteran running back. He might even be a better pick in my opinion. And the reason being is that if he's going to be drafted at the end of the first early round, second round as of right now, and they sign Devonta Freeman and people start taking Miles Sanders at the middle of the second round or even the end of the second round because of that, those people are a bunch of donkeys and making a huge mistake. Devonta Freeman was one of the least efficient running backs last year. And the year before that, he started to become very, very inefficient. So you're having a running back who's not good anymore and aging and old, taking the place of the backup running back who would be Boston Scott. Who Boston Scott was very good last year, efficient in the receiving game and also the running game. So if Devonta Freeman, a bad running back, is going to take away touches from a good running back in Boston Scott, how is that hurting Miles Sanders, right? Those touches become more inefficient and it means Miles Sanders' touches are just going to either go up or just not be as much impacted as they would as if Boston Scott was playing well behind him. And also what's going to happen in ADPs, like I said, Miles Sanders is going to drop because people are going to think Devonta Freeman is actually a good running back because people have recency bias. And you think about Devonta Freeman three years ago when you took him in like the sixth round of your drafts and he ended up paying off for you for the Atlanta Falcons. That's not the same Devonta Freeman. It's nowhere near that guy. It's a totally different guy. It's a dusty old running back at this point. So Miles Sanders for me is locked in as a guy that I want to be taking. If you get Miles Sanders at the beginning of the second round, right, you have a late round pick and maybe you get Joe Mixon than Miles Sanders. I can't think of better starts than that. I honestly, I can't think of much better starts uh, than that. And then if you get Todd Gurley in the third round and you get these three running backs we've already talked about, you're sitting really, really pretty. So the additions, yeah, Elijah Holyfield, a running back from the Panthers, did nothing last year. Literally didn't see a touch. Uh, you have Corey Clement, one-year contract, former Eagle. He's going to be like the third string running back as of right now. The subtractions that are going to impact Sanders are going to be, obviously, Brooks is now hurt. Uh, you're going to have Jason Peters, who's still a free agent. Maybe they sign him and have even more reason to now that Brooks is hurt. Uh, Nelson Aguilar, Jordan Howard, Avate. So a lot of offensive line pieces are now gone. They kind of addressed offensive line a little bit in the draft with a fourth round pick of Jack Driscoll. And they also, they took a sixth round player. They took a bunch of wide receivers in the draft. So maybe there's a saying, or maybe there's a thinking that thought process that Miles Sanders doesn't see as much passing game work because they actually have wide receivers this year. Jalen Rager, they traded for Marquise Goodwin during the draft. They took John Hightower and Quez Watkins. And I don't really believe that. This is a good pass catching running back. He's going to be used in wheel routes. He was probably the best uh, running back. He was up there with Saquon last year, Damian Williams when Damian Williams was healthy as running back to a running Alvin Kamara and just running nasty routes, being lined up in the slot all over the place. So Austin Eckler should be in that department as well. Yeah, these are guys that um, and, and have a ton of upside and they're not just going to be phased out of their offense. When you catch 50 balls in the first half of the season, you're lucky if you're crossing the 40% of the snaps threshold. This is what uh, Miles Sanders was doing in the first half of the season last year. Um, in week three, he was only playing 35%. Week four, only 28% of the snaps. Week six, 30% of the snaps. Week eight, just 17% of the snaps. Left that game early. Week nine, just 37% of the snaps, right? He's playing below 40% of the snaps in like six out of the first eight games of the season. And then things change in the second half of the season when this is his snap count. 88.5%, 91%, 92%, 55%. 71%, 80%. That is an elite snap count. If you're going to get 70 to 75 to 80% of the snaps out of Miles Sanders, and you're going to get somewhere around 18 touches out of him per game, and he's going to push for a 300 touch total season with elite receiving game work and a pretty decent offensive line in front of him. Yeah, Miles Sanders is a must draft running back. And if you get him at the second round, you're going to have a very good fantasy team this year. Leonard Fournette is our final must draft early round running back. You can probably get him in the third round. So if you start your draft, let's just say you're, you're drafting later on, right? You get Joe Mixon, then you get Miles Sanders. You got a really good start to your draft. You could probably land one of Leonard Fournette or Todd Gurley with your third pick. Right now, I prefer Todd Gurley, but Leonard Fournette is close. And everybody's out there rolling their eyes. Oh my God, Sal. 
the, the, the Jaguars hate Leonard Fournette. He's he's such a bad player. Okay, first of all, bad player. You're absolutely out of your mind. He's not even going to be. He's going to be 26 years old by the time the season ends. That's still a good running back in his prime. He's a running back who came out ultra athletic and has been good since coming into the NFL. And last year he saw just an insane receiving game role. Last year in receiving, fifth interceptions amongst running backs with 76. He had 522 overall receiving yards. That was also fifth. And he saw 100 targets as a running back. Only one of four running backs to see 100 targets last year. And he was second. He was Christian McCaffrey light in terms of routes run last year. 483, 32.2 routes run per game. So much opportunity for him in what was a bad offensive line that's going to improve because they were young. In what was a rookie quarterback who's also going to improve, in my opinion. And what was one of the worst defenses in the league that naturally is just going to improve a little bit. He ended up playing 91.7% of the snaps, 265 rushes for 1,152 yards and three touchdowns. The three touchdowns is going to regress. When you're seeing over 325 total touches between rushes and receptions, you're going to see more than three touchdowns more times than not. That's what he got last year. So he's in line for regression. But Sal, they brought in Chris Thompson. I don't care. When was the last time Chris Thompson did anything? Three years ago, before all these injuries took place, before he wasn't an older running back? I don't care about Chris Thompson. Leonard Fournette is miles better than Chris Thompson. But Sal, they drafted LaVisca Chenault. I like LaVisca Chenault. He's a wide receiver. You can tell me that they're going to put him in the back of like a gadget guy like the Packers used to do with Randall Cobb. And like some teams do with their running backs, but LaVisca Chenault is a wide receiver. He's going to be a fine wide receiver in my opinion, but he's not a guy that I think is going to take rushing attempts away from Leonard Fournette in any major way. He's going to take backfield receptions away from Leonard Fournette. The whole idea that LaVisca Chenault is there is going to hurt Leonard Fournette is, is mind-boggling to me. Unless you think the Jaguars offense is just some sort of just next-gen offense, right? And they want to start putting their wide receivers, talented ones, in the backfield, which I think when the Packers did with Randall Cobb was a good strategy. Unless you think that the coaching staff has turned an edge everywhere in the NFL. You're giving a lot of credit to those guys. LaVisca Chenault is not lining up as a running back more than maybe twice per game. And that's even a high number. So if you think that's really hurting Leonard Fournette, you got something else coming your way, in my opinion. Even if Leonard Fournette's routes run go from 32 a game to like 25 per game, that's still elite company. This guy is still going to catch passes, even if they're checkdowns, and he's going to start to get into the end zone more. He also had two touchdowns, actually three touchdowns called back for penalty, and one touchdown blown with the whistle dead. He was in the end zone, the whole pile, but they said they blew the whistle early on. So there's major touchdown regression coming this guy's way. I mean, he had 54 red zone attempts, which was fourth in the league. And again, he only scored three touchdowns. Major regression coming this man's way. 17.3 fantasy points per game, 1,674 total yards. You guys want to fade Leonard Fournette, who was a beast last year, just didn't get into the end zone. Over 650 total yards in a contract year. They didn't pick up the guy's fifth year option. This is a contract year for Leonard Fournette. He has to go out there and say, okay, after this season, I have to make teams at my age 26 season, where contracts start to get a little bit iffy for running backs between 26 and 28. He has to say, I have to make these guys want me. Sign me to a two or three year contract to end my career somewhere else. Leonard Fournette in a contract year, we have not seen this yet from Leonard Fournette. We have not seen this since college when he was playing for the NFL prospects of his draft capital. I mean, obviously nobody did in college. He was injured that year, but he was just a piece. So Leonard Fournette is a guy that I want to get a good amount of this year. And just to look at the overall touch counts for Leonard Fournette last year, 17, 19, 21, 31, 27, 26, 31, 26. You want to be fading a guy who's getting this type of a workload? 33, right? 23, 33, 23, 18, 20, 18. This is the workload that you want to be fading because of Chris Thompson, because of LaVisca Chenault, a wide receiver, all of a sudden that's now going to be a starting running back on the Jaguars. Um, this is just crazy talk in my opinion. You have an athletic running back still who's in line for positive regression from touchdowns, who's going to have a, a quarterback who's in his second year, which should make the offense a little bit more efficient, who's going to have an improved offensive line just because of experience, getting younger and more experience is going to naturally make them better. And then also a defense that was terrible last year and naturally bad, really bad, and, and standout outlier defenses regress positively towards being, even if they're still bad, not as bad, which helps gain script for Leonard Fournette. So those are four running backs that I think are the must draft early round guys, some first round, second round picks, potentially third round picks for some of those last guys. Let me know what you think of the video. Please do hit the like button for me real quickly and the big old subscribe button that popped up. If you got any value out of this video, it really does go a long way in letting this video reach more people. This is my Supreme Draft Guide up behind me. It's linked down below. You can get it. You just come onto my landing page on Fantasy Sports Focus and you click get the guide. You go there. You can also go down below for Monkey Knife Fight and get it for just $10 depending on when you're watching this video. Check that all out. Take advantage of the offer. If you want to leave a podcast review, whether you're watching on YouTube, you want to go over to the podcast review, Sal Vetri Show on iTunes. $50 giveaway once a week and only like four or five people a week leave podcast reviews. So you have like a 20% chance of just making a quick 50 bucks this week. So you might as well do it. The Sal Vetri Show, leave a five 
five-star review and just say something nice about the show. Leaving a five-star review literally takes two seconds. You press the five-star button and then also leaving a review takes literally 30 seconds. So in less than a minute, you have a chance and a 20% chance of winning 50 bucks. Go ahead and do that link down below as well. You can hop into the community discord totally free down below and also download the top 25 running back rankings in the banner above if you have not already done so and if you don't have the draft guide. If you have the draft guide, well, then you have the access to the rankings, the key stats, the player profiles, all for the great price of just $10. And then you also get a free ticket on Monkey Knife Fight to play over there with that $10. So trying to do as much as I can here for you, the consumer, for you, the follower, for you, the supporter of me. So thank you for supporting my work. Hit the like and subscribe button before you go. And I will see you all in the next one.